Lord, we just are so honored and so blessed, God, to sit at your feet, to be your people, to be salt and light on this earth for you, Lord Jesus. But Lord, we can only do so by your power and through your enabling of your Holy Spirit, God. And so, Fathers, we just take a break here in the middle of our week and open your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would wash over us and feed us, God, and prepare us to go back out, Lord, into this world and continually be preparing us for when you take us home, Lord, that we will be a pure, spotless bride, Lord. That is our desire. So speak through your word. Thank you for this amazing book, Lord. And um, just bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness, the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So in the beginning, God created. Where do you start with, you know, a be statement on the beginning of everything? All time, all energy, all matter, all morality, all immorality, scientific theory, spiritual worldview, personal accountability, heaven, hell, eternity, social standards, political sta stances, origins of life, anything else that can enter into the consciousness of man, it finds its ultimate uh, foundation right in this sentence here of Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. If this is true, then what else matters? If there is a supreme transcendent being so powerful that he is able to speak into existence a physical universe beyond the scope of puny human intelligence, yet he is so personal that he can leave a revelation like this of what he did and how he did it, and he can speak to our minds, then there is a purpose beyond me, for me, and what else matters? I better be right with whoever wrote this. My life better be revolving around the author of this book and I better understand you know, what he desires of me. If this isn't true, then nothing matters. So the language used in this biblical creation account, it's not philosophical speculation, nor is it exact science. It is just simple, take it or leave it narrative. This is how it went down. The author has historically been recognized as Moses, which in part that is true. Technically, Moses was the editor. Authorship is attributed to him because this book is included in the Torah. The Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible have been recognized without dispute as writings of Moses. But the only book of the Torah the only books that Moses actually could have written as originator would be Exodus from about chapter 3 on and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, but not the last chapter of Deuteronomy, of course, because it talks about his death. He was an eyewitness, however, of all the other events in those books, and he wrote as such. Genesis is a compilation of what are presumed to be written documents, oral tra traditions, some of them carried through the flood on the ark. Moses collected and edited these into a book called Origins, which is what the Greek word Genesis means. The Hebrew name is Rashith, or beginnings in English, which is the first phrase of the book and the whole Bible. In the beginning, it says, there are several things that the Bible reveals existed that, that either existed or took place before the beginning. Divine wisdom is personified in Proverbs chapter 8 and is portrayed as saying, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I have been established from everlasting from the beginning before there was an earth. Proverbs 8, 22 and 23. 
We're also told in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, that God saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Titus chapter 1, verse 2 says that our hope of eternal life was promised before time began. Jesus was glorified and loved in the presence of the Father before the world was, he says in John 17, 5. So there's several things you see in the Bible. Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1, 20 says, foreordained to be the sacrificial atonement for the redemption of fallen humanity, Revelation 13, 8 says. And so while there's no descriptive information, it doesn't say, you know, here's what it looked like before any of this. There's no descriptive information of what lies beyond or before the beginning, what it looks like, mostly because there's no human vocabulary that could describe it. Paul went into the eternal realm and he says, I can't describe it in human language. So there's no description of what it says. But Paul, it says, well, there's no description of what is before the beginning. What we do know from the passages of Scripture that I just shared is that by God's divine wisdom, the redemption of fallen humanity through God's personal intervention, that was the key component in the foundation. That is the purpose for this creation was the redemption of fallen humanity through God's personal intervention in that. And as we go through, I'll point out it's amazing how God has created things just so, so that he could do that and elevate us into a position of the eternal realm with him. And so the mystery of the gospel is what really existed before creation itself the cross is the mystery of the gospel paul says first chronic or first corinthians 2 7 that was foreordained before creation we speak the wisdom of god in a mystery even the hidden wisdom which god ordained before the world was uh, unto our glory a quite an elaborate mechanism that god calls into being here to provide eternal life, which to say in the beginning is saying that time itself was the first order of business. There was a beginning. God created in the beginning the heavens and the earth. The word God, Elohim in Hebrew, it's not a personal name, it is the Greek Hebrew term for it, deity. So it's a title. The words used over 2,600 times in the Old Testament, many times in conjunction with the name Jehovah or Yahweh or Hashem, the unpronounceable name, however you want to, you know, pronounce an unpronounceable name and identifies God with Jehovah. He's introduced here in this creation account. Grammatically, Elohim is a plural noun. In this context, it's used to identify a singular being, God. Whenever the plural noun Elohim is used in the Bible for the creator, like this, the verbs and the pronouns used in conjunction with the word are always singular. So it's a plural noun, but all the verbs, pronouns, singular with it, which provides the foundation for developing the doctrine of the Trinity or the triunity one God and three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The word created, verse 1, comes from Hebrew verb bara. It speaks of creating something out of nothing, which is an action that can only be performed by an all-powerful being, as is described here. What he created, it says, was the heavens and the earth. The earth is not speaking just of dry land, which appears in verse 9, but earth speaks of this entire mass of which our planted planet is composed, planet earth. Heavens, plural, is the rest of the created universe. So you have the earth and the, all the rest of the created universe. There are atmospheric heavens, there's outer space heavens, along with spiritual heavens, several of those mentioned throughout scripture. The order in which creation is stated in verse 1, heavens and earth, is not incidental. At creation, the heavens took precedence over the earth. From here on out, earth will take precedence over the heavens throughout Scripture. 
because that is a perspective from which all who read God's word, his revelation here in the Bible, that's a perspective from which we view things from earth to heaven, except here in verse 1 of Genesis 1. When speaking of the order of creation, it's heavens, then earth. That's important in understanding the overall narrative right here in chapter 1. That extends through chapter 2, verse 3. Because some mistakenly view verse 1 as a heading or an introduction. That's what they want to make that. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period with the narrative of the creation account beginning with verse 2. That allows them to cram all kinds of presuppositions like evolution into that little space right there between verse 1 and 2, a little white line there. They cram everything you can imagine into there by making verse 1 a heading or an introduction. It makes it convenient for espousing evolutionary theories, but it brings problems to the rest of the Bible right from the beginning. The evidence that verse 1 is an opening sentence, it's the first part of the opening sentence of the narrative is as opposed to a heading. First of all, is that in the original language, verse 2 flows out of verse 1. Literally, verse 2 reads, and the earth was without form and void. So there's not a pause there. It's not that the earth became without form and void, but that was the state of the earth in the beginning, without form and void. Also, as I said, verse 1, the heavens take precedence over the earth in this sentence, but in the following verses, everything including sun, moon, and stars appear as revolving around the earth. Thus, if verse 1 is a heading or an introduction, it doesn't correspond to the rest of the narrative here that it introduces. And so by just allowing the first verse to be as it naturally is, the first half of the opening sentence, everything flows in natural order. By disrupting that, making verse one an introduction, confusion enters right from the beginning. And most people who teach that are pretty confused. So it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. This is describing the state of the earth as it was in anticipation of the impending creative acts that are going to be listed here, that are going to bring the earth into its intended condition for the outworking of God's redemption of humanity. The idea being that God didn't just create the earth instantly functioning. He could have but through calling into being all the raw materials, so to speak, there in verse 1, God had this multidimensional canvas upon which to now form and work out the preconceived plan of redemption, a plan that divine wisdom had formulated before creation began. The earth was existing, but not intended to remain without form and void, without order or meaning. And darkness was on the face of the deep. That's an expression that further states an anticipation of what is to come only where form and void relate to the physical characteristics. Darkness on the face of the deep relates to the spiritual condition. With the final clause of verse 2 bringing that spiritual anticipation into view. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Spirit, here in verse 2, is speaking of the Holy Spirit, third person of the triune Godhead. He's consistently represented in Scripture as the source or the formative cause of all life in the world, whether it's physical, intellectual, or spiritual. The Holy Spirit is the author. This life giver is pictured hovering, verse 2. It's a word that speaks of brooding the way that a mother bird broods or sits on its eggs to regulate the temperature necessary for a safe and successful hatching. Now, wording is strictly symbolic. God is not a bird. Some people have taken from that as well. God's a bird on, they have a bird God. And the world's not an egg, okay? <laughs> The language, it's meant to express God's love and intimate care. 
that is extended right from the start of this creation of which we are a part. With God as the subject in both verses 1 and 2, the whole thought is describing not a series of events as much as a coming together of everything in preparation of what comes next. Everything's ready, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And, he, and God divided the light. God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness, called the light day and the darkness night. And so purpose springs forth from this formless void. Light replaces darkness, keeping in mind that the heavens are in existence at this point. And so this is describing the ordering and the bringing out of darkness of the earth, which was in existence as well, all of which was in a state of anticipation of this taking place. And now simply by the authoritative command of God in the following verses, all the created physical elements needed to establish God's redemptive plan are brought together. This is the first time God speaks in the Bible in verse 3. And the main characteristic of divine speech is authority and the power to back that up. And you see the same qualities are ascribed to Jesus in the Gospels. It says the crowds were amazed because he spoke with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. And he had power to back it up. When he said, be healed, someone was healed. Literally, verse 3 says... Then God said, light be, and light was. The thought of light as the first creation, while it's not implicit, but it infers the dawning of the first day. Light is amazing creation of God. Technically, light is electromagnetic radiation made visible to a human eyeball and creating sight. Physically, Light can be measured by speed, 186,282 miles per second. It's pretty fast. It's how my son drives. <laughs> the fixed speed of light, that fixed speed of light provides never changing constant measurement upon which equations and theories can be developed that are invaluable to those who rely upon laws of physics for the work. Physically, light can also be measured by pressure that it exerts upon an object in its way. If a light is shining at you, there is pressure being put upon you. You wonder why you're so weighed down all the time. Turn the lights off, you know. But it's very infinitesimal. It's not that much that you can feel it, but it can be weighed. On a practical level, it's measurable. And so just in a physical sense, order is produced by God's first command, let light be. And there is a speed, there's a weight. The word be, that denotes the existence of light by whatever means or from whatever source it enters into a certain dark location. Here an already existing light permeates at the command of God into a region previously darkened. God created light not so that he can see or that he can see what's going on or perceive or darkness and light are both alike to him, the Bible says. Light was created so that we can see God, we can see his, not see him, but see his work and see his glory in his creation. Now this is the start of a pattern here, verse 3 and following. It takes place over six days from verse 3 to the end of the chapter, the creation hymn, it's called. A hymn not of the creation of the entire universe, because that took place in verse 1. This is a hymn of the creation of now all the separate elements and ingredients that are going to go into establishing God's work here on earth. All those elements, ingredients are brought to bear upon this earth in a sequential order unto the creation of life. It's very similar to how the New Testament speaks of the new creation of a redeemed human heart. The first work of God's grace is the entrance of light, spiritual illumination, into a previously darkened heart. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says. Here it says, and God saw the light that it was good. So God contemplates his work, judges it basically, and relates a standard, a goodness. When you get to man being created in God's image, in verse 26, it is qualities like this that relate us to God's image, understanding and judgment, looking at, evaluating things outside of myself, being able to evaluate what I see in terms of a standard. That's the leap that takes place from animal to man. I'm able to judge good from bad. And I have the ability to align myself with one or the other. I have the choice. God, as we'll see here, is the author of only good. What he commands and what he carries out is only good and perfect. Thus his creation begins that way until sin and rebellion enter in and mar that which is good and perfect. And so, verse 4, God saw the light, it was good. He divided the light from the darkness. Now, the celestial bodies, sun, moon, stars, have not yet been designated as light holders and signs and season markers that they're going to be designated in verse 4. There is simply differentiating at this point between light and darkness, just the essential building blocks upon which to then bring together his next stage in the creative process. God differentiates between the two, dark and light, by assigning to each one a fixed position within time and space. And you consider, you know, the ramifications that would be involved in this. It's pretty staggering because there are physical as well as spiritual components to separating light and darkness right there at the beginning. It's an incredible separation that takes place right away. It's what day one consists of, creating day and night. God called the light day, verse 5, the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. So after separating the two, they are named. Before this, everything was un unidentified and without meaning. Now meaning and order are introduced. Identity is given. This is day, this is night. And remembering that creation is being established in accordance with the preordained plan of redemption. It's so important to remember all this. God's not just bored, you know. This is it being established according to a preordained plan of redeeming human beings. Day one, with the separation of light from darkness, very significant. As scripture goes on to say that God is light. If you're on his side, you're on the side of God. First John 1, 5. He himself is, is clothed with light, as with a garment, Psalm 104. He dwells in light, inaccessible to mere mortals like us, 1 Timothy 6:16. 6, God is father of lights, James 1:17, and light dwells with him, Daniel 2. Our Lord Jesus Christ is light of the world, the true light that gives light to every man who comes in the world, John chapter 1. He is the light to lighten the Gentiles, Luke 2.32. And he calls us, those who follow him, to be light in the world, Matthew 5.14. And so the separation here begins a separation that goes throughout the Bible and includes us on the side of light if I'm saved. I used to be on the side of darkness. But now, you know, a, a change takes place. But that differentiating began right here, day one. Evening and morning, first day. It's necessary, you know, when understanding the Jewish concept of a day beginning at sundown. And so evening and morning of the first day. We think of the day beginning with sunrise, morning and evening. But biblically, evening and morning were the first day, verse 5 says. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, firmament here, rakiah, 
comes from a word that means to spread out. So it'd be like if I were there, one moment there would just be this illuminated watery soup. And then whoosh, I would see a separation take place. And I would be standing all of a sudden at ground level, looking at a vaporous cloud covering up above. I would have to be in a boat or be able to stand on water because there'd be nothing but water above and water beneath with a firmament or an expanse in between, verse 7 says. The word translated heaven in verse 8 is a Hebrew word that means sky. And it's interesting that there's no goodness attributed to the sky. Not that it's bad. It's just empty space. And so verse 8, it says, you know, the evening and the morning were the second day. No goodness here. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So here on the third day, two creative works are performed by God, each separately being seen as good. Verse 10, and then we'll see in verse 12. That compensates, apparently, for the lack of goodness that's attributed to the firmament in day two. Not that the firmament, again, was bad, but we are to infer that the firmament was simply preparatory for the twofold work that's going to be done the following day. It's interesting that God allows for a diversity here within his design process even. He doesn't just do it exactly the same every day. If this were written by man as mythology, it would probably be exact every single step but God always does this you'll notice he never does it just the exact same the fact that it's not the exact same actually gives greater legitimacy to this but God said let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so the waters under the firmament described back in verse 7 evidently contained all the material elements that constitute dry, dry ground in solution form, a suspended liquid state. And by the authoritative command of God, all the molecules that make up rock and minerals and metals were brought together, separated from the molecules which presently make up liquid water so as to produce dry land that God called earth, verse 10, and the liquid that remained, God called the sea, verse 10, and he saw that that was good. So this huge quantity of water that exists on our planet, and we've been blessed with, this has baffled scientists for years. Where did this come from? In one old Time Life film series, if you're old like me, you remember these things were pretty popular in the 1970s and 80s, Time Life film series for little kids. Finally, they said on the, on the film series, finally the day came when falling raindrops didn't just hiss away in steam, but they stayed to start filling the crevices and corners of our naked planet. Then it rained, and the accumulation of the seas began. That accumulation did not take place in the opinion of modern geologists. The program went on to say it didn't take place through the great deluge of all time that has often been described. But so far as anyone can tell, it may merely have rained as it rains today. Nature had plenty of time. It probably took a billion years to fill the oceans. So as far as anyone can tell, it may have, and probably, these are the scientific terms that they use to describe where everything comes from. You know, they don't know. For decades, scientists believe the ocean's water was coming from comets filled with water that were encapsulated in water. The haley Bopp comet disproved that. They were able to do experiments during that whole thing. They just don't know. They don't know where does this water come from. Here, instead of starting with a molten planet, no water, God separated the building blocks of all matter forming land and leaving water. 
Centuries later, as we'll see, he will once again reshape the surface of the earth through a global flood, with the earth reforming into continents and with the water receding. So the ground is ready. In verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Now notice here, God doesn't call plant life into being independent of anything else. He calls the earth to bring forth plant life. And so this is a mediating creative act on the part of the earth in which a threefold vegetative division is called forth grass, seed yielding herbs or more complex plants, and then fruit trees. The division is occurring with regards to the seed. With grass, the seed is incon inconspicuous. Seed yielding herbs have obvious seed on them. The fruit trees, their seed is in the fruit. And so that's the, what differentiates these three, each according to its kind. So grass can't become an apple tree and a mango can't produce asparagus. They're going to be separated in some way here. There's great variety within various kinds, but nothing evolves into different kind of plant. It's going to be one of these three. Each plant contained the ability to propagate itself having seed within itself, God gave the command, the earth obeyed, verse 12, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, verse 14, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens so to give light on earth and it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. It's almost like offhand, you know, I also made some stars, only billions of them, you know. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good the fourth day. So order is now brought to the celestial planets that surround the earth. Each step brings more organization, not to just a beautiful garden, which the plant life, you know, brought forth on the third day provided, probably very beautiful. But all of this is in preparation for God's redeeming work that he's going to do in the lives of those he's going to create in his image. He's just laying the groundwork. This fourth day takes up where day one left off. The creation of light is now organized into use, a useful system for the earth's benefit. The purposes for God's organizing these luminary bodies, sun, moon, stars, they're given in verses 14 and 15. First, to divide day from night. While day one established night and day, through the separating of light from darkness, here now specific light sources are created to develop an ordered sequence for the benefit of humanity, for us. First, you know, just day and night. Now, you know, there's also, you know, dividing that through these planets, and they're also then used for signs and seasons, verse 14 says. God arranged the stars in the heavens into various constellations that are seen from earth as signs. And while the signs of these constellations, what they depict, a special knowledge, it's been corrupted through astrology. And so it's pretty much anyone's guess what they all mean. For thousands of years, the various signs of the zodiac provided information that was understood by every culture and every language here on earth, and it spoke to them. Many believe the gospel was being proclaimed through the zodiac system. 
in ancient times. That could be. Like I said, it's been corrupted. Of course it has. Satan doesn't want that taking place. Seasons speaks of agricultural seasons, but more specifically the religious agricultural seasons that are enumerated in the Mosaic Law, in which the annual feast days are all tied to the sequence of months as well as days and years, verse 14 says. High holy days, Sabbath years, and the year of Jubilee, all based upon the sequence of planetary movement and then the specific light sources to rule the day and to rule the night. Verse 16, this too was done by God and he saw that it was good. And verse 18 says that it ruled, they ruled the day, God saw it was good. So the evening and the morning were the first day, were the fourth day. Verse 20, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Here now life beyond just vegetation is introduced into God's earthly creation. Living creatures in the water below and in the sky above. Now it doesn't just say fish, but living creatures or living organisms literally, of which there can be found over 30,000 living organisms in just one drop of water if you take it from the right source. These living organisms are differentiated from plants in that plants were brought forth from the earth, verse 12 says here. In verse 21, the same Hebrew word bara, translated created, out of nothing in verse 1, same word is reintroduced here in verse 21. And so God created great sea creatures, every living thing and all the birds, especially created life principle is called into being out of nothing else. While the bodies of the animals and these birds are organic, they come from the same elements of the earth. And so in that way, they would come from the earth. The idea behind the phrase, every living thing that moves, verse 21, the idea is that it is of a higher order than a plant. There's a consciousness that animals have, very limited, but it's a higher order of creation. And once again, each according to their kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them. So there's a beatitude added here. He bids them well with regards to their self-propagating and filling the earth. And so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. God saw that it was good. And so it's here, the, just as the celestial bodies... Day four, the sun, moon, and stars were furthering of God's creative work of day one where he created light and separated light from darkness. Day four, with sun, moon, and stars further organized that aspect of creation. And then day five, with water and sky, animals, that, that was a furthering of day two where the waters were just separated from, with a firmament. Day five filled the waters with animals and the, the, the sky above with birds. Now day six furthers the creation that took place on day three where God called dry land to appear and be vegetated. Now the same life principle that was created the previous day in the water and sky is brought about in creation of land animals whose biological bodies are brought forth from the earth, but they have higher consciousness. They have the same life principle. Cattle 
verse 24 would speak of domesticated animals, creeping things, speaks of reptiles, amphibians, insects, and the beast of the earth speaks of wild animals, all after their own kind, it says once again. And God saw that it was good, verse 25 says. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the, the depths of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now this verse is introduced in such a way as to impress upon the reader that this is the high point. This is the final point. It's what everything else has been leading up to. This is, it's, with that, I mean, you read this, and you read then, this is the high, this is what everything has been leading up to, then this is either a very presumptuous declaration to say that out of a vast, unfathomable universe filled with billions of galaxies, each filled with billions of stars, to say that out of all that in this one particular Milky Way galaxy around this one star within its collective solar system, there's this one blue dot, the creator of all of this has placed the crown jewel of his creation, us. That's either the ridiculously presumptuous, which is how science and people see that, they go, that's completely ridiculous. It's either highly presumptuous or we are pretty valuable. We're a highly valuable creation of God's. The Bible declares the latter. In fact, it just, you know, represents that as just matter of fact. You know, that's who you are. You're in God, creating God's image. This is what is of preeminent importance in God's creation being described here, human beings. You know, think of what angels and what it must look like for heaven as human beings just kill one another and just disregard one another and it just hurt one another. When you see this, and each of the prior aspects of this creation account the thing created was summoned into being. Let there be light, let there be a firmament, let the earth bring forth animals. The language here elevates this to more intimate procedure than before. It's more hands-on, we would say. It's like, let us do this. Once again, the plurality within the one Godhead is just assumed as God takes counsel with himself, not with angels, as he says, let us make man in our image. It's not talking to angels. And while plants are living organisms, they just have a body. They don't have a consciousness, thankfully. Or, you know, it'd be a great slaughter every time I mow the lawn. You know, just, <laughs> no! Animals are a higher form of creation. They have a body and a consciousness. Some more, some less. Human beings not only have a body and a consciousness, but also an eternal spirit. The word image here in verse 26, it speaks of spiritual attributes that are shared by man with our creator. It's what produces our ability to be in a relationship with him or not. We've been created with the ability to understand divine truths such as justice, righteousness, love, many other things. And in being in possession of that such understanding, it's what it means to be made in God's image, among other things. That we can think on the same level, plus, you know, the likeness enables God to become one of us and take on our lower, you know, physical image, part of this. But that's what, uh, you know, allows for the incarnation. Likeness implies something more inward. It implies an individual personality and the ability to express that abstract individual personality through free will choice with the involvement of a conscience in which God speaks to me. 
it is through the use of such shared attributes with the Creator that He extends authority to human beings. Let them have dominion, He says there at the end of verse 26, over, I think it says, the fish of the sea, because my Bible's all ripped up, but it says, over something of the sea, over birds of the air, and over the cattle of all the earth over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now the Hebrew word bara, created, is used three times in this one verse. There, verse 27, expressing both a pinnacle in the creation narrative as well as expressing a Trinitarian involvement in the actual creation of the first human being. Man is the Hebrew word Adam and is used in a generic sense for both male and female. Not that this is one androgynous you know, being, but both are depicted as an integral part of mankind, both male, female, equally independently possessing an eternal spirit capable of personal fellowship with the creator. The second stage of this particular creative act where it says male and female, he created them. That's going to be elaborated upon in chapter two, very much in detail, where this aspect of the creation account is revisited and brought out in greater detail. Verse 28 says, and God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here God extends to man the authority to rule over this brand new creation he just brought into being. He doesn't say here, have at it, you know, good luck. But he establishes a divine covenant, which will also be elaborated upon in chapter two, we'll see. But this covenant is related here in two parts. First, the blessing at the beginning, a beatitude. That is an acknowledgement of God's goodness and love is being shown upon the first couple, bidding them well. He then gave them several commands what to do here in the, in the end of chapter 1. We will see a negative command, what not to do, will also be introduced into this covenant in chapter 2. But here, they were to be fruitful and multiply populate this new creation that God's prepared for them. Have a whole bunch of kids. Fill it and also subdue it, verse 28 says. That speaks of being proactive in bringing this world and its various components under their control as they themselves are under God. Then they are to have dominion over the creation. Get it under control and then rule over it. Specifically, the animal kingdom is mentioned in verse 28. A fourth commandment has to do with their diet in verse 29. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit, fruit yields seed to you, it will be for food. So they were to be strict vegetarians for obvious reasons. God didn't want them to get high blood pressure, you know, or diabetes, you know, some kind of toxic disease from eating poorly. Actually, none of that even existed at this point. They couldn't eat animals because death had not been introduced into God's perfect world. Thus, the same vegetarian diet was imposed upon animals. In verse 30, he said, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given green, every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God's assessment, as he looks upon the six days of his creative labor, his assess assessment is indeed it is very good. Thus, this, this narrative moves into chapter 2 for three verses. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God knocked off for the weekend. God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. 
then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So the, the very good assessment of his creation is going to change as things here in Genesis progress. But as far as the initial creation, it was accomplished in six days, and the seventh day was set apart. It is blessed and sanctified, verse 3 says, for in it God rested from all his creative works. The seven-day week is the only increment of time that is not based upon some astronomical movement. One revolution of the planet is a day. One orbit of the moon around the planet makes a month. One orbit of the planet around the sun makes a year. But a seven-day week is arbitrary. Why seven days in a week? Well, we're told right here because God said so. This is God's record of how everything came about. This is what he says. Or I can believe man's story that a fairy princess kissed a frog. And the, the frog became a coyote, and the coyote became a camel. The camel became an orangutan, which became a handsome prince. From you, from the goo to you, through the zoo, is how some people say it. Take your pick. You know, I'm going to stick with this, and we'll pick up at verse 4 of chapter 2 next time. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you, God, for just telling us how it all came together. It's very fascinating, and I'm sure there's probably more to it that we will learn one day. Maybe not. I don't know, God. All I want is you and to serve you and to know you more. And so, God, I pray that your word, as we just study it, take it in, Lord, that it would wash over, it would feed us, teach us. But God, I do pray right now as we pray together as one body. Lord, and, and gather together in one accord, Lord, that our prayers would be honoring to you, that you'd be pleased, Lord, as you look upon your body here on earth, and that, God, we can just offer to you, Lord, just prayers that are effective, they're fervent, and that avail much. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your word to our hearts in Jesus' name, amen.